Welcome to the Korea Now podcast. I'm your host, Jedley Henry, and on today's show, we have Sharon Yoon. Sharon has been an assistant professor at Ewa Women's University, a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pennsylvania and at Osaka University, and received her PhD in sociology from Princeton University as a Korea Foundation postdoctoral fellow. And she's also the author of a new book due out next year, 2020, entitled The Cost of Belonging, an Ethnography of Solidarity and Mobility in Beijing's Koreatown. And it's this subject that we're going to be speaking about today through some of her other writings and hopefully touching on that future book as much as possible. A lot of people out there in the Korean studies community are well aware that there's an awful lot of migration out of North Korea into China. What is less well known is the South Korean migration into China, as well as the reciprocal movement of that Korean community, sometimes back into South Korea. And this comes with all the challenges that you would expect on both ends. To research this, Sharon went and lived in the communities in China, in these ethnic Korean enclaves. She attended underground churches, as well as large mega churches. She interacted with entrepreneurs and businessmen and women on short-term contracts from South Korea. And what is so interesting about this is what she found with the ideas between Korean identity inside Korea and what Korean identity was becoming elsewhere in places like China. And more interestingly, the challenges between these communities. Despite having so much in common, there seemed to exist a lot of animosity on the ground, a lot of distinction. Inside these Korean enclaves, South Koreans and the Korean Chinese would live entirely different lives. They wouldn't shop at the same malls, they wouldn't socialize together outside of work, they attended separate churches, held separate annual sporting events, went to separate cultural events, and generally lived simply different lives. There were high levels of distrust, huge amounts of motivated reasoning, and a constant undertone of the feeling of discrimination coming from both directions. Now there is a much deeper history here of course. The migration into China from South Koreans didn't just happen recently. It's not just a modern phenomena after the opening up of China with Deng Xiaoping. Before this, under Mao Zedong, there was a significant amount of Korean migration into China, largely to take up agricultural work or to start farms of their own. But it is the modern phenomena, the modern trade, that has this phenomena of South Koreans often heading there to try and make their fortune, and often heading back disappointed after a few years. Or of Korean Chinese coming to South Korea to find work of their own, often to find that when they arrive, they are treated as second class citizens, if not by the law, then culturally by their fellow Koreans. There is so much in this podcast and so much fundamental detail. Sharon doesn't just build up a history of this, but she creates a complete cognitive approach, a whole set of understandings and frameworks for which the similarities and the distinctions between these communities and the failures of them to share the same identity and to feel as a single ethnic nation comes to be. This is not just a fantastic narrative retelling of what happens on the ground and of Sharon's life when she was there but it fills in a lot of the psychological and a lot of the anthropological detail and all those challenging questions that spring to mind whenever a situation like this inside these enclaves seems to not just be happening, but seems to be continuing in perpetuity. But from here on out, I'm going to let Sharon explain the details for you. Now, as always, this podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. So if you do want it to continue, please consider donating to the Patreon account or the PayPal link attached below. Failing that, you can always share, like, or comment on the podcast across social media. And if you have any suggestions for future guests, feel free to send them to me, and I will do my best to get those people on the podcast as well. On that, and to talk through ethnic identity in the Korean enclaves in China, this is Sharon Yoon. Sharon Yoon, thanks for coming on the Korean Art Podcast. Thank you for having me. So today we're going to be speaking about the Korean enclaves that live inside China. And this is such a fascinating topic, but it's one that many people have an idea about, but may not have uh, a lot of the details, a lot of the history, a lot of the fundamentals, and a lot, of course, a lot of the demographics about who lives there. So I suppose as a first question, I might just start broadly, and that is a question about uh, who lives there, these 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 Korean populations, how large are they? Where are they? And uh, how long have they been there? How long have they been migrating there for? Mm -hmm. 
Um, well, that's a really great question. You know, talking about, you know, when the history of migration starts is always kind of tricky because people are always migrating um, from the beginning of time. But when we think about like the first mass wave of migration from the Korean Peninsula to China, probably started in the late 1800s, in the 1880s, um, with Korean farmers crossing into the Manchurian border. Um, and this was probably maybe a few thousands. So by the beginning of the early 1900s, you have around maybe, what, 50,000 Korean farmers who are also spreading across to um, the Russian Far East. Um, and then the second massive wave of migration starts during Japanese colonization. And this is when people start migrating in hundreds of thousands, right? So um, by the end of World War II in 1945, as a result of Japanese um, mass kind of migration of peasants to Manchuria, we have around 2 million Koreans who are living in um, uh, the what's currently uh, northeastern China. And all throughout the Mao Zedong era, they kind of lived in very tightly knit um, agricultural communes uh, that were run by these Korean kind of ethnic kin and village uh, villagers from like their original hometown from the Korean Peninsula. And that continues uh, up until the 1980s. Um, and so my research begins uh, in the contemporary era in around 1992. And why is the migration happening, so to speak? Because um, is it some, I, mean, I suppose with that deep history, it can be a very a factors, but why is the modern migration happening? It may seem for many people like a strange kind of phenomena that seems to be happening here. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there was a very pivotal moment in Korean history. In 1992, Korea, South Korea establishes diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China. And this is, you know, a milestone in terms of economic uh, revitalization for the Korean Peninsula. And so through, through, through those diplomatic normalization of ties, you not only have new waves of financial capital going between Japan or going between China and South Korea, but also massive waves of people, especially um, third and fourth generation Korean Chinese minorities who have been living throughout the Mao Zedong era, post-World War II, in these small rice uh, paddies, these agricultural communes, who are first, you know, they want to go back for two reasons. One, because of, you know, it's their the country of their ancestral heritage, and also because South Korea represent, pre presents to them a new economic opportunity <clears throat> to maybe earn 10 times as much as they would have if they had stayed in these uh, ethnic villages. And so in 1992 is the very beginning of massive waves from China and South Korea, as well as the reverse. So <clears throat> that would indicate, at least from hearing it from my side, that yeah. a lot of the people making this migration is uh highly skilled or at least highly educated in a way often people have this idea of mass migration being an underskilled phenomena but that at least indicates the modern trend might have a different mm. kind of uh, uh, i suppose image to them yeah i mean that's a also a really great question but also very complicated um so in 19 what what my research looks at is in 1982 you have a lot of different types of migration coming from both ends of the, uh, from both South Korea as well as China. So on the one hand, you have low skilled migration. These are Korean Chinese peasants who are going into South Korea and working in the 3D industry, which is dirty, uh, difficult and dangerous. Like as cheap labor, you know, they're going as nannies, they're going as service workers, they're going as construction workers. This is probably the bigger wave. So there's about 200,000 I think of them who are starting from the early 1990s up until the mid 1990s who are going to fill that market. 
And then there's also highly skilled labor. And this highly skilled labor is coming mostly from South Korea. You have in 1997, the Asian financial crisis and massive numbers of South Koreans are losing their jobs. Um, a lot of the entrepreneurs there, their businesses are failing. And so they see China as an opportunity to start over again. And so there you have South Koreans who are entering China, large cities like Beijing and Shanghai. And these are morally high, highly skilled la labor. And they're entering China as businessmen. They're opening their own entrepreneurial firms. And then from, they also need to hire uh, bilingual managers, bilingual uh, people who will help them break into the Chinese market. And they hire Korean Chinese who are also from Northeastern China, but these are more highly skilled. So these are mostly college educated Korean Chinese who are settling in Beijing and Shanghai, large cities, and they're looking for jobs. And these South Korean entrepreneurs present them with you know, a good opportunity. Which I suppose begs the question, how integrated yeah. are these communities? It, it seems though you have such large uh, Korean populations in these areas. And through your research here, you, re you write a lot about the social networks and the ties yeah. and uh, these kind of back and forth interactions. And you just mentioned the brokers there, the idea that the Koreans go seeking these Chinese Korean brokers to try and make the connection. So these enclaves, how integrated into the larger Chinese society are they, if they are at all? Okay. So there are also like several different types of enclaves. Um, the enclaves that you're talking about that are in kind of major cities within China are uh, urban enclaves. And in these enclaves, you have South Korean businessmen, you have South Korean expats who are dispatched from large South Korean conglomerates like Samsung and LG and so on. Um, and then you also have Korean Chinese mi minorities who are working for these South Koreans who are, who are also starting their own businesses as well. And so in terms of these urban enclaves that started to form in, what, the past three decades, um, I would say they're, you know, uh, semi-porous in the sense that there are also uh, highly upwardly mobile Chinese um, who are buying kind of businesses and real estate properties in these enclaves because it's, at least in Beijing, you know, they're in kind of these upper middle class residential districts. And so I wouldn't say they're totally cut off uh, from the Chinese, uh, surrounding Chinese society, but it, you know, it's very still distinct in the sense that there is a high concentration of Korean businesses and Korean residential areas and civic organizations in like maybe what, uh, five kilometer radius. Um, so you do have very high concentrations. There's another type of enclave, which is the rural enclave. And these are enclaves in the pre 1990s era, uh, which I talked about earlier, you know, starting in what the 1880s, you have Korean peasants. These enclaves uh, were very isolated from the surrounding Chinese uh, community. And that is why the Korean Chinese were able to um, uh, uh, continue speaking the Korean language and observing Korean customs, even in the five decades after uh, World War II ends and Mao Zedong's uh, regime. So how transient are these populations? Not the rural ones, of course, that have been there for much longer, but the new modern ones, the ones that are coming there to make money, so to speak, looking yeah. for new economic opportunities. Are they lasting? Are they surviving? Are they setting up home inside these places? Or are they doing a, a smash and grab kind of thing in and out to try and make money, but always with an idea that I'm going to return back to Korea? Um, so... Uh... There is a high level of kind of uh, volatility and fluctuation among businesses and people in these urban enclaves. Um, and so people are always going back and forth. Um, but the nature of how long and how stable and why they're going back and forth varies according to uh, their demographic backgrounds. Um, so, uh, if, 
in my research, I isolate three kind of major demographic groups within the Korean population in these urban enclaves. So there are South Korean expats, there are Korean Chinese uh, minorities who are third and fourth generation uh, bilingual, and then there are also the South Korean entrepreneurs. And all of these, these three groups have a high level of fluctuation and volatility, but there are, you know, differing ranges in terms of the sense of precariousness this volatility brings in the community. Um, and so we could say that the South Korean expats are the most stable. That's because they are dispatched from the Chebol, from the South Korean conglomerates, uh, for a very kind of set time period, like two to five years. And they know going in that they're only staying for two to five years. Um, and so when they're settling into these enclaves, you know, they don't really want to kind of learn the language or they don't feel like the need to adjust culturally. They just want to go in, get their job done, and then come back to South Korea. Um, the second type of the demographic group are the South Korean entrepreneurs. Um, and they have that most kind of the highest level of, I would say, like precariousness, because as I stated before, you know, these are people who have lost their jobs. Um, they're going in, you know, all in <laughs> with the retirement savings or building new companies in a foreign territory. But their their hope is that they will reach some kind of uh, level of economic stability. And when they do, maybe be able to go back to South Korea. What happens is, you know, their businesses end, end up failing and then they go end up going back to uh, uh, South Korea. Korea prematurely in about two, three years, sometimes five years. Um, and, you know, because their their economic situation is so precarious, there's this feeling of, you know, am I going to make it? Um, when am I going to be able to go back? Am I going to be able to go back? And so this also kind of adds a level of chaos in, in their, I, I think, their emotional lives as well. And then the third type of uh, Korean, the Korean Chinese, they're also going back and forth, but it's more kind of opportunistic. You know, they're, they see uh, Beijing uh, as their home. They, they want to go to South Korea to get resources uh, to uh, learn about uh, the kind of new business ventures that are happening in Seoul and bringing that back into uh, China and seeing what they can do with it. But their volatility is more in terms of like, how can I, you know, how can I make my position stronger economically? And uh, how does this play out inside China? We, everyone has this image these days yeah. of, of, of immigration and all the benefits that come from it, but it also, also always tends to provoke some sort of backlash within, even if it's just a small section of the larger society, no matter how uh, wrong that may be. So how uh, is this idea of large Korean enclaves? I know this is a broad question and a bit tricky, yeah. but how, how is it viewed inside China itself by the Chinese? Hmm... So I did some interviews with um, kind of upper middle class Han Chinese who bought apartments in the Korean enclave. Um, and so my kind of understanding is limited to these, uh, the, the data that I collected. But, um, you know, the sense that I got was that uh, they were... Uh, you know, that the South Koreans, they weren't taking the time to learn about China and that they were looked at the South Koreans looked down on the Chinese. Um, and because they weren't really investing their time, they, they weren't, there was a sense that the South Koreans weren't really in it for the long run in China. And so, um, you know, there was a lot of distrust and kind of tension between uh, these upperly mobile Han Chinese as well as the surrounding uh, Korean community. And there's also a level of ignorance as well because uh, they didn't really distinguish between Korean Chinese or South Koreans. I mean, some did, obviously, but there was a, I saw um, a tendency to kind of group South Koreans and Korean Chinese all in one large category. Um, yeah, and a sense of kind of, I guess, like disdain, like even condescension looking down on uh, the South Koreans for uh, coming to China for 
uh, various reasons that they see as suspicious. So before we get into, which is yeah. a wonderful part of your research, the idea yeah. of a co this cognitive question, the idea of uh, the idea of Koreanness in these enclaves and the wonderful thought process that you put around it. Uh, uh -huh. you've, you mentioned a couple of times of how you did the research, and I suppose we really should open that up here because this is not the kind of thing that you can simply read a book about or go through a library. I, it seems as though a lot what happens here, a lot what you did was on the ground itself. So I do wonder how hard this was to do, how tricky it was, were you trusted, were you accepted? Because it, it seems as though small communities like this may have a certain mm -hmm. reticence to reporters coming in. I'm sure they're not always following every uh, regulation and law that, that that is there. They may be in violation of their visas. They may be doing other things there. So uh, how did you find the research and uh, what was the methodology, I suppose? Um, so I am an ethnographer, which means I, um, I go into a community um, and I try to just become uh, an ordinary kind of resident uh, member of whatever community that I'm studying. And in this case, I moved into the Korean enclave uh, and then I, I lived there for on and off for a period of two years. Um, and then I found a job in the enclave working part time at a clothing boutique for a Korean Chinese entrepreneur. I started going to an underground church for Korean Chinese minorities as well as um, a state sanctioned South Korean church. Um, and then I became really active in those church communities. Uh, and then I did a variety of volunteer work. And I also did uh, an internship stint at a major South Korean conglomerate. Um, and so through these various uh, experiences, I, I tried to, you know, form real personal relationships with people from various uh, different, I guess, uh, economic and gendered and uh, cultural backgrounds so that I got a sense of who the major actors were and um, what kind of uh, attitudes that they have towards each other. Um, and so in that sense, like it was emotionally taxing <laughs> uh, <laughs> because, you know, uh, they're real relationships and a lot of people are suspicious about an outsider coming in. Um, but on the other hand, it was really rewarding, too, because in the end, I felt like I was uh, writing a story that was reflective of uh, people whose voices wouldn't have been heard otherwise, who entrusted me with, you know, what they saw as uh, very significant uh, hardships that they were going through. And I tried to take that into consideration while I was uh, making sense of the story. One difficulty that I had in, in this process because it was so personal uh, was the fact that the South Koreans and the Korean Chinese had so much distrust towards each other. Um, and, uh, you know, like there was so much kind of animosity between those two groups that if I if one side knew that I had strong relationships with the other side, you know, it was just, it was viewed as kind of maybe even like an act of betrayal or suspicious. And so for me to balance those two uh, was extremely difficult. It's also extremely difficult because uh, precisely because there was these tensions, um, the Korean Chinese feel like they are discriminated against by the South Koreans. Uh, and they perceived me because of my accent and, uh, you know, my parents are first generation South Korean immigrants in America. They saw me as South Korean. And so for me to break that barrier of distrust and for, for, for me to kind of try to uh, show that I was not just uh, there to, I guess, um, I don't know, criticize them or look down upon them, but I was there to try to understand where they were coming from. That took uh, a really long time and it was also extremely difficult, um, but also rewarding in the end, yeah. So let's talk about that question of trust because yeah. that that's quite fascinating here. Now, as you mentioned there, the idea that there are South Koreans living there and there's also Korean Chinese. And uh, in many people's minds, uh, Korean nationalism, it has been built around a, a, a number of ideas. But 
Koreanness should run as the link through all of this. And yet you mentioned through your research here that these two communities live in distinct neighborhoods. They don't shop in the same malls. They don't socialize together outside of work. They go mm -hmm. to separate churches, have different sporting events, different cultural events, exactly. congregate in different places, different businesses. So I, I guess as a first, first look into this, I might get open up that issue for us, this, this huge bifurcation between these two communities that many people would assume from the outside would be quite harmonious and quite, uh, I suppose, um, assimilated. Yeah, exactly. Because um, you would imagine, right, um, if you're uh, immigrants in a foreign country sharing an ethnic background that you would bond. And that was the attitude that I had c going in. You know, that was the presumption that I had going in. Um, and what I found was actually, you know, there was so much... Uh, uh, hostility and conflict between the South Koreans and the Korean Chinese. Um, and a large part of my research was trying to understand why and where it was coming from. Um, and I found that um, nothing happens in a vacuum. And what I mean by that is uh, the South Koreans going into China are not going in with a blank slate. They're going in with uh, a preconceived notion of who the Korean Chinese are. And that preconceived notion is like fully kind of established and heart solidified uh, in, in South Korea, in Seoul. And there's so much media. Uh, there's so much, um, I guess, kind of public perception in South Korea towards the Korean Chinese, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, hundreds of thousands of the Korean Chinese migrated in, into South Korea after, 19, after 1992 as low-age labor, and they have been seen as kind of this underclass and as people who are, um, you know, uh, who are distru distrustful, who are criminalistic, and who are going to kind of con you and take your money and and maybe even kill you while you're while they're at it. You know, all of these um, newspaper articles uh, in the 1990s about the Korean Chinese and kind of framing them in that way. So when the South Koreans go into Beijing, they bring those uh, attitudes with them and. They're trying to work, they're, they hire these Korean Chinese, but at the same time, you know, it's so hard for them to, to kind of disassociate these uh, stereotypes that they brought in with them with the relationships that they are forming at the ground level that, I mean, I argue that it, it uh, is part of the reason why many of the South Koreans end up losing their businesses and going back to South Korea, uh, ha having become more more impoverished than how they began. So that's an interesting question here. It comes through your research quite strongly. Yeah. The yeah. idea that you touch on a number of aspects that, that people often assume would bind people together and are not doing so in this way, and we will, and we will come to them. But what you seem to have mentioned there was the idea that despite all this ethnic heritage and this shared uh, uh, linguistics and the shared history, that it seems that the one of the larger problems between these two communities is the feeling that they don't have a common fate, so to speak, as in they aren't treated fairly inside South Korea and when they're in China they don't run the same risk so how strongly was that feeling within the community that this is what is dividing them the idea that they just don't have the same uh, structures of reality around them and they just don't have the same common fate mm, that's an excellent question um, and I got that uh, idea from uh, the earlier works on ethnic enclaves by Alejandro Portes, who I worked with when I was at Princeton. And his idea was that um, even if you are uh, even if you are a disadvantaged minority in an ethnic enclave, people are bound by a sense of common fate. And so they're able to overcome the disadvantages that they face as individuals by forming a collective identity. And that was not what was happening in Beijing. Um, and the sense of common fate uh, is def definitely different between the South Koreans and the Korean Chinese because um, the Korean Chinese feel like they are discriminated against by the South Koreans uh, not only in Beijing, but also in South Korea. Um, and so th I think that is the major tension, right? So uh, again, the Korean Chinese, even though the ones who are in Beijing are uh, by and far uh, 
you know, the elite of their group. You know, they're highly skilled. A lot of them have elite uh, college degrees. Um, but a lot of their mothers or their fathers or their aunts are in South Korea working as janitorial staff or as members of the service sector, um, and they're getting discriminated uh, every day. And they're hearing these stories, you know, every day because they're talking via, you know, Kakao Talk or social media or Facebook and so on. Um, and so, in a sense, the sense of common fate is no longer just secluded within the ethnic enclave. But uh, it, you know, it is within kind of the broader transnational uh, community, which is linked between Beijing and Seoul. And so I think that is the major reason why they're unable to bond over a common ancestral heritage in Beijing. How strong through all this does uh, mm-hmm. Korean culture come out? Because I just imagine that two communities separated in this way, mm-hmm. culture, yeah. as you write quite strongly through a lot of your research as well, culture is this fluid thing that changes all the time, though in our minds we seem to imagine it as this thing that's stuck and is generational mm-hmm. and you can bump into someone after 50 years and you recognize your same culture within them. And mm-hmm. I wonder how the differences in culture seem to be playing up, if they are being noticed at all. Um, so there is a sense of, I think among the Korean Chinese, there's a sense of, I guess, how would I put it, inferiority, or I guess not inferiority, but like anxiety over where, over whether the version of the Korean culture that they were able to pass on through many generations during the Mao Zedong regime, whether that was authentic, Right. And so from the perspective of perspective of the South Koreans, you know, they they use that sense of anxiety that in order to kind of, I guess, uh, soothe them, them themselves. Right. So uh, this wh- which kind of Korean culture is authentic? You know, which ki- taste of kimchi is authentic? <laughs> like which right? Uh, uh, these things become actually very highly symbolic. Um, and, and I talk about it um, in more detail in my work, but um, I think one danger that I find in a lot of uh, the students that I teach are, you know, that the Koreans, you know, they've been more signified, right? They uh, spent many generations in China, and so they've become cultural hybrids, and so their version of Koreanness is not uh, the real, the authentic Koreanness. And that's, I don't think that's the point. There is no real or there is no authentic Koreanness. Koreanness is always contextualized. There's always a power dynamic in, in framing what is real or what is authentic Koreanness. Um, and that's precisely what is used in order to kind of cast a group as uh inauthentic or as in of inferior or as or as um, a minority and and that's precisely what happens between the South Koreans and the Korean Chinese. Now another question that comes through this and it, it yeah. does have similarities with uh, immigration from North Korea to South Korea and that is people attend coming into the same communities where they think their language is going to be this great positive for them that they can speak the same language suddenly exactly. and yet they are recognized by their accent and then for and therefore there, there are strong lines drawn between them and the community they think they're going to seamlessly walk into and the accent draws a hard line between them and the larger community and I'm assuming this must be the case inside the Chinese enclave inside the, inside the Korean enclaves in China exactly um, so uh, as I stated before, you know, the Korean Chinese, they lived in these rural enclaves uh, for about maybe, what, four decades, four or five decades uh, after World War II. Um, and so they're, the type of Korean that they speak, uh, a lot of it, it has a lot of uh, influence from North Korea. Uh, and a lot of these Korean peasants, they actually migrated from the northern part of the peninsula. Um, and so they speak with kind of a North Korean accent or a dialect, Um, a lot of their words also have become signified. Um, And so the ways that they speak, even uh, the type of like grammatical endings uh, are different. Um, It's not unintelligible, like they can communicate perfectly with each other, uh, but it's not the kind of stand, quote unquote, standardized Korean that 
uh, South Korean students learn in school or that, that is spoken in the media right now. Um, and so when these Korean Chinese, they find jobs under these South Koreans, especially in the South Korean conglomerates, you know, this t- the type of language that they speak becomes a source of their discrimination and their marginalization. It's seen as, um, again, as I stated, not official, not standardized, kind of hybridized and 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 in a way it's that is a part of a rationale that's used to not compensate them as highly as other uh, South Koreans who are hired locally in Beijing um, and that is also used to maybe kind of not grant them promotion when even if they are skilled in other areas um, and so language is a very uh, sensitive um, topic in, in the Korean enclave. Now, you mentioned a few times, and of course this is evident inside South Korea today, the way South Korean culture tends to look down on things from China. They tend to yeah. look down on cheap or in there's a whole variety of ways in which they tend to look down on China. And of course yeah. this must affect the Koreans living in the enclave here. And I'm wondering how this, you mentioned on many of these Koreans that go there, they come back having failed in their businesses. And I can only assume they come back with horror stories, right or wrong. They must blame something about China itself or the communities themselves. And there is some references that you put through your research here that you you, you say, I, I you interview some and they come back and they say they failed because they were blackmailed by their, by their uh, Korean Chinese managers. So I wonder how many, how much the failed experiences of Koreans in China are exacerbating the poor image in of, of China itself inside South Korea mm, that's also a tricky question how much is their failure attributed to their perceptions of China is that is that yes 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 I would say mostly um, I would interpret it in a sense of uh, the South Koreans, they look down on uh, the Korean Chinese and they also look down on the Chinese also to a certain extent. Um, And this sense of uh, superiority or the sense of condescension becomes a significant barrier for them in terms of forming relationships of trust with their workers and also with um, a prospective clientele um, and, you know, just becoming more integrated in the surrounding Chinese community. And these are the factors that lead to their downward mobility. So if the, if the South Koreans were able and i find that the ones who were able among the people that i interviewed the ones who were able to um understand and appreciate the local heritage the local customs to form relationships of trust not only with the korean chinese but also with the han chinese um and they still were able to use like the south korean capital right um fi- whether financial or also kind of in terms of ideas or business ventures wh- wh- whether they were able to combine these two that was the recipe for success unfortunately what you have uh it m- by and far is uh most of the south koreans coming in they were unable to break these barriers um and so in a sense they they were they became isolated and so that leads you know that leads to uh vulnerabilities um economically now before we run on to some interesting questions about your time with the churches and some wonderful anecdotes there uh, we think we should build up the question just once here quite strongly of your cognitive um idea your con- your cognitive I- identification and your answer for some of the failures of these uh of of these two communities to be born together and you use some of the work of paul dimaggio here yeah. and it is some wonderful i mean i won't get into too much i'll let you open up but it's this wonderful thoughts of how the mind works and how it processes information how it runs on different schemes so i might get it open that up as a I think we've touched on it in a few ways but we'll probably we're circling around your thesis here and not really nailing it down so before we get into some of the of the wonderful on the ground anecdotes I might get to try and uh, nail this down so people out mm-hmm. there are, are clear and where you're coming from so um, 
Paul DiMaggio, uh, who is a professor I studied under at Princeton, he uh, is known for his work on culture and cognition. And that borrows from social psychology. And it is a theory about how the ways that we are cognitively wired, like the ways that our minds work uh, biologically is uh, how that kind of interplays with the ways that maybe we hold on to stereotypes or discriminatory behavior. And so in order for us to be able to overcome uh, these barriers, we have to become aware of our limitations in terms of how our mind works, right? So that is this idea of schemata. The idea of schemata or schema is um, this notion that we we don't we're, we're unable to process all this information in our everyday lives in our surroundings um, in a piecemeal fashion, but rather we group them into categories according to our past experiences, right? So, um, in terms of uh, uh, racial dynamics, you, you find schemas are are always working uh, to kind of confine our perceptions of someone that we're meeting for the first time using uh, media stereotypes or public perceptions or or co- past conversations or past experiences in order to interpret new information. So it's not that we're meeting someone at, from a blank slate, but we already have this kind of preconceived notion of who that person is according according to their race in this in this scenario, right? Um, we see how that happens between the South Koreans and the Korean Chinese because the South Koreans come into to Beijing already having formed this notion of what a Korean Chinese is, and a lot of that is you know they're they're poor, they're they're from a peasant background, um, they're money hungry. Um, and they are, they don't have this pure kind of Koreanness about them, but it's signified. Um, and there's also the sense of distrust. And so when people, when South Koreans meet Korean Chinese for the first time, you know, they're coming in with those notions. Um, what I thought was interesting was, you know, uh, coming in as a graduate student studying this for the first time, I thought naively, like if they live together and if they <laughs> work together, right? why wouldn't they be able to overcome these schema? Like, why wouldn't they be able to form these individual relationships and trust? Um, But then I realized that actually what happens oftentimes is that you have to have a significant relationship with this other person in order to break those schema. And even then it's very difficult. And so instead what happens is that those schema, they become hardened with superficial contact. So if you have Korean Chinese and South Koreans living side by side, but they're only engaging in superficial uh, interactions, they're going to think, oh, South Koreans are condescending, they're arrogant, they look down upon us, and then the South Koreans are going to be like, the Korean Chinese are criminalistic, they're money hungry, um, and they don't like us. And those preconceived notions are 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 only solidified unless, you know, you have like, this Romeo and Juliet story of one person engaging in a really deep relationship, knowing, getting to know that person as an individual and being like, okay, this person is different from what I had known. Right. And so that is one part of the reason why these, these, um, the solidarity is unable to kind of form despite these, the environment that they're in, the enclave environment that they're, they're living in. So that's a great little explanation there. And of course, the Romeo and Juliet an- analogy really touches on the what, how you can overcome these things, right? Yeah. Um, uh, let's move on to some wonderful examples of you on the ground there and your interactions. You mentioned it earlier with the churches. Now, the churches, as you mentioned, were a, a way into the community that, that they were this, they had this central role that people may not fully understand from the outside. So before we get into some of the actual uh, specific anecdotes in the specific churches, I suppose we should give an overview of uh, churches in China and the importance of of Korean churches themselves, because China is not a country like others. It d- still tends to view churches as political entities and political activities. And for many people out there listening, they will know that uh, that Christianity is quite uh, significant inside South Korea. But it's more than just turning up to mass, like many people do around the world. Korean churches are hugely social organizations. So, I and there's two types of churches, of course, from your research as well. 
um, these small underground ones that may not look like churches at all, and then these large mega churches. So that's a very poor image I'm painting there. So I might get you to clean it up for me. So uh, what is the the scene on the ground in of, of these churches inside these enclaves, and how do they operate, and uh, what do they bring to the community? So there are two types of churches, as you pointed out. There's the state-sanctioned church, which means that the Chinese government has approved of this church. Um, and a lot of these state-sanctioned churches are for foreign expats. And so for state-sanctioned South Korean churches, you need to show in, when you're entering into the church facilities that you are a foreign national in order to be able to participate. Um, there is this uh, understanding that the Chinese government has people on the ground level surveilling and monitoring all of the activities that are happening on the church grounds. So it's highly regulated, tightly controlled. Um, there are even stories of how <laughs> the Chinese government has planted like officials who are undercover, who are inside the community, making sure that no one is kind of going off uh, the regulations, um, and if they do, and they report back that you know there is kind of unregulated activity going on, that church can be shut down. So there is a high level of, I would say, anxiety about uh, following the rules, whether the church will be able to uh, subsist over a long period of time. Um, and whereas other church communities, they can have like Bible studies in their home. All of these activities have to occur on the church grounds during these set hours that is approved by the government. Um, a lot of the Korean uh, missionaries and the pastors find that uh, environment very stifling, and they don't think that they're able to do "quote unquote" God's work in order to, in in those uh, conditions. And so they go off and they create underground churches, which is essentially churches that are not approved by the government and are therefore illegal. Um, and these uh, churches range; some of them have like hundreds of people. Um, they uh, rent out office facilities uh, in the middle of the uh, uh, city and they hold, hold worship services. Um, and some of them can be like maybe a group of five to 10 people in, in the con that where worship services are held in the confines of someone's home. Um, so there's a big range of these underground churches. Um, the, the big underground churches that I became involved in, the one that I became involved in had 300 members. Um, the Chinese government knew that the where the church was and what, what was going on there, they kind of held tabs on, and periodically they would threaten to shut it down, but as long as the church official, uh, as long as the deacons and the elders had good relationships with the local officials, um, it was okay. Um, and so, yeah, there are two different types of uh, religious communities um, in, in the enclave. So let's touch on some anecdotes here and take us first to First Presbyterian. Now, yeah. these are wonderful stories. I'm going to link your research below the podcast, but I'm going to encourage people to go and read them for themselves. This is, as we touched on before, this is a lot of face-to-face, um, -face, on the ground reporting, sorry, research, and it really plays out like wonderful stories and you really get a great picture. So as you do it, I'm going to encourage listeners to go and also read for themselves, but take us to First Presbyterian, how you found yourself there, what type of church it was and importantly what links if it had any to South Korea because it seems to be uh, a lot of South Korean churches have links in into these enclaves or at least they simply donate money for the setting up of new churches and I, I suppose that's a great way to start this picture so take us to First Presbyterian. Um, so I got linked to First Presbyterian, Presbyterian through a South Korean missionary who had connections with various Korean Chinese underground churches. And initially I went around uh, the major Korean Chinese underground churches to pass out uh, survey questionnaires. Um, but I wanted to become more deeply involved in one of the churches. So I chose First Presbyterian. And how can I explain, you know, it was a very surreal experience even being driven there. Um, you know, it's in this 
building on Sunday, which, you know, because it was an office building, uh, there was... It, on the outside, it seemed as if no one was using it, right? But the, the the lights were all out. There was no one in the parking lot. It seemed kind of empty. But then the South Korean missionary, he led me into this unlit lobby into like the elevator. And then once the elevator hit a certain floor, you know, it was like bright and there were people around and uh, it was this, you know, vibrant kind of worship service that was going on um and so that is a distinguishing feature of an underground church there are no signs out outside um they they're they don't really pass uh they don't really advertise where it is all of these things are hush hush because um obviously it's uh, uh unofficial um but uh when i went there um uh you know, it was, I sat in the pews and I tried to become involved in the very beginning, but I was summarily turned down. You know, I wanted to become a part of the choir. Um, and then they were like, no, you can't because of so-and-so regulations. I wanted to um, become involved in various Bible study groups. And then I said, I was told that I didn't fit in. Um, and so it actually took me about, what, three months of just sitting in the back of the pews and just saying hi to everyone for them to finally let me like let me in in a sense right can, and, I, can I ask why uh, you think that was because most people's experience of churches is yeah if you want to get involved get involved right? take it to as much as you can so yeah, why because, why do you think that was happening to you because there's so much distrust towards the South Koreans um they saw me as a South Korean and they were like, I think they were testing me. I think they said, you know, this person is probably going to leave. Um, and I don't want to spend my time, invest my energy with this person. And she probably doesn't really think highly of us anyway. So why should we let her into our community? Um, and so I think at the three month point, you know, in a way I, I kind of, pass their tests <laughs> um, and I also another turning point was um, uh, I was you know this was going on and I was being rejected by interviews as well among many of the Korean Chinese that I had approached and I was just so exhausted emotionally I didn't know how I was going to finish my dissertation I was at the end of my line and then I went to a morning service uh, um, mor morning service uh, it's called a day daybreak morning service worship ser service every day at i think 5 30 they have a worship service for some some of the members um and so i went at 5 30 i went earlier i went at five o'clock because i couldn't sleep um and then the pastor was so so <laughs> surprised <laughs> was sitting outside you know he's like why are you here and then and I was like, oh, you know, I just came to pray. And then he said, okay. And he let me in. And then some of the um, leaders of the church were al already there. Um, and, you know, we prayed together. And um, I think that was a turning point. Uh, we prayed together. But I think they saw, okay, she's in it for real. Like, she is up at 5 in the morning <laughs> <laughs> wanting to break bread with us. And, like, like this poor soul, this poor graduate student, like let's help her out. And so I found out that after prayer, they they met for breakfast, and I ended up going to that prayer morning service every day for I think about like half a year. And you know the stories that they shared around uh, the breakfast table. You know they were such an important part of my um, data collection and such an important part of like forming trust. After that, you know, all of these doors start opening. Everyone started, you know, being more open to wanting to talk to me, being curious about who I was. Um, yeah, so that was a breakthrough point for me. So I want to talk about that point you mentioned there, that people yeah. talk, uh, sit around talking about their own stories. Yeah. And this seemed to be an important part about these churches. Uh, as we mentioned before, a lot of the, the, the Koreans in these enclaves are there for economic reasons. They're trying to start a business as an entrepreneur's. And the church became, it seems like it became a venue for these members to help each other out, not mm -hmm. financially per se, but through economic, I, um, you know, uh, information, so to speak, or the way they can exchange practical information. And uh, it, it, how, how fundamental did the church seem to the economic lives of these people? 
So the church has historically been a very important civic organization for immigrants, um, and that is precisely what happens in Beijing as well. Um, but there are kind of, I guess, very two very different stories that I found while I was in Beijing. One was more uplifting. In the case of the Korean Chinese underground church, I found that um, you know, they saw themselves as discriminated and marginalized against in from the South Korean community as well as the Han Chinese community. And there's a sense that, you know, if we don't stick together, no one else is going to help us. And so even though they face so many various barriers in terms of finances, in terms of business know-how, in terms of finding people to work for them, I found that like after prayer meetings or after Bible study, you know, they shared information, they helped each other out. When someone was in a tough spot, like people from members of my Bible study, they just showed up, you know, without any, you know, we didn't want anything in return just to support this person. And so that ended up being a really important source of an important resource for Korean Chinese entrepreneurs in Beijing. And I attribute a lot of their success to these tightly knit social networks that are formed in these underground churches. This doesn't happen for the South Korean entrepreneurs. What I find is um, for the South Koreans, for the state sanctioned churches, it is highly hierarchical and classed. And you have people who have a lot of money uh, sticking amongst themselves and people who, the entrepreneurs who are highly volatile and economically precarious, you know, they kind of don't see themselves as fitting in with this wealth wealthier expat group and so the south koreans they find themselves even more isolated in the south korean state sanctioned churches um and this isolation is also a part of the reason why they don't have a support group in their community and and on top of that they're facing all these legal institutional barriers in china and so you know it's it's extremely hard for them to um sustain uh, entrepreneurial businesses so let's touch on the other side of that coin then because yeah. you went to this smaller church with this with this tight knit community but you also attended a large mega church now i'm going to pronounce this wrong uh antok i believe uh 2000 members it's got connections into other countries uh it's a brand it feels like an institution so i might get you to take us there now in the same kind of way because again in your research here there's it's a wonderful storytelling kind of uh, research and it's great to read but yeah uh, yeah i might you to take us there to this much, uh, I suppose, dramatically different church experience. Mm -hmm. So, um, Antioch is a mega church, right? There, as you stated, there are two thousand members. It's it's like a very smoothly running transnational, where you can even say global organization that has branches all over the world. You know, it's a mega super powerhouse in terms of uh, resources and networks and leadership and, and so on. Um, and when you go into the church grounds, you feel that way, right? They have all of these impressive facilities. They have several sanctuaries. They have a cafeteria, a bookshop, everything, right? Um, and yet what I found was even though it was so wealthy and even though they had so many financial and material resources, um, the South Korean entrepreneurs who attended those churches didn't really benefit from those transnational or even global resources. And what I found was, um, you know, a lot of times they they didn't they didn't feel safe to be vulnerable to the other members of the community. So if someone was struggling, they didn't feel, they felt like they would be judged if they talked about how they were struggling. And so what ended up happening was they would just go to service and then go home. There was no kind of um, uh, socializing afterwards. Those, those tightly knit networks, they happen in the off hours, right? After Bible study, you know, you go out to eat, you share what's going on. And then people, you know, they try to help you out. And there was none of that uh, fraternizing in um, in Antioch. Instead, you had fraternizing, but it was mostly among the wealthier population. Um, and so because of that, uh, uh, Antioch wasn't a, a important kind of institutional resource for the South Korean entrepreneurs. 
So that question there of inside the community itself and the wealthier side of this and how it divides, this comes through quite strongly through your research. The idea that within the community itself, there is a very inside that church itself, there's a very noticeable recognition of division. And this divides along wealth lines. So wives of entrepreneurs, they talk about where, where they're going to send their children. and They send them to these incredibly expensive schools. Well, at the same time, the entrepreneurs find themselves quite alienated uh they often don't have time for the socialization they talk and they send to talk in a very in, in different worlds so while as the first church we spoke about seemed to have a much broader sense of community to bring people together i might get to what that economic division that seems to be drawn inside this much larger mm -hmm. mega, mega church right and a lot of these communities often form around women right um and so the the women's ministry is really important and what i found was even when they do have cursory conversations, uh, the com the type of conversations that they have is really, as you put, alienating. It's, you know, the sense of common fate that we talked about is so absent, strikingly, actually, even more than absent, it's, you know, accentuated that they don't have a common fate when they talk with each other. Because on the one hand, you have wives of expats who are sending their children to these uh, very prestigious international schools that cost, what, $30,000 a year per child, whereas you have an entrepreneur who's even... He can't even make a lot of times thirty thousand dollars U.S. dollars a year himself, right? So for him to fathom spending that just on tuition is a really alienating experience. It's for them, it's like, oh, you're in a different class, you're in a different life situation than I am, and so it accentuates their feeling of precariousness as well as it accentuates their feeling that, oh, I can't be vulnerable in this space. Like I can't share myself. I can't share uh, the difficulties that I'm having in, in this environment. And instead, you know, the church, it just doesn't function in the ways that it does uh, for the Korean Chinese um, at, at uh, First Presbyterian. So as a final question here, yeah. I might ask something a little difficult um, and of course quite broad ranging. How do you see the future of these enclaves? Because today a lot of what we've been, we've been talking about and a lot through your research comes through ideas of identity and trust and those challenges that tend to people think things will bring them together and they don't tend to and it, it works in ways that we don't always expect. So how do you see the future of these enclaves inside um, China? Do you see them, in, is, is there a way in which there is, they're going to be brought closer into a broader transnational Korean nationalism? Or do you see over time uh, a gradual shift away into an old, uh, perhaps a, a new nationalism and a new national identity of their own? So how do you see the future of these enclaves and their own uh, national identity? Mm, that's a great question. So I think the way that enclaves uh, function now in China, uh, especially in terms of my research, um, is that it's no longer these tightly knit communities where people feel like they can go in order to shelter themselves from discrimination and, you know, kind of... Uh, form collective communities and overcome barriers together as disadvantaged minorities, as we saw um, in previous decades, right, in the 1970s and 1980s. Instead, <clears throat> I find that these new urban enclaves are transnational enclaves, and they're transnational communities, and there's a lot of uh, influence that South Korea has, whether it be in terms of the media stereotypes in forming class and ethnic and cultural cleavages, even within the Korean community, um, and even in terms of cleavages financially, in terms of wealth, of class, um, among South Korean, South Korean expats and Korean Chinese. And so for them to form a collective community, I think is extremely, like the barriers are much, the structural barriers are not, it, uh, are not easily overcomable. And so in that sense, we have to, we have to see the enclave as not a place of shelter as it was um, in, in earlier years, but in, uh, in it, we have to see it as um, these 
uh, places of pot- potential financial opportunity if you have the right type of cultural background and the social networks to um, help support, you know, yourself like the Korean Chinese do. Um, um, and so it, it, it's, in, it's in that sense. It, it, the 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 enclave itself is changing right so the types of opportunities the types of vulnerabilities and precariousness that uh the enclave life presents to people who want to live there is going to be different um and so my hope in terms of policy is is for people south koreans or for korean chinese or other ethnic minorities or immigrants who are uh you know settling into new environments for them to understand that these ethnic communities are constantly changing and this is one direction in which they're changing and we can see how this is becoming um this type of model can be seen in other parts of the world like there are korean conglomerates that are uh setting up similar types of korean enclaves in the in southeast asia like vietnam or laos um or thailand you know there are major south korean conglomerates they're set- setting up factories and headquarters in in these areas taking advantage of cheap labor um and there you know there's the, the types of korean communities that are there are also similar um there are not the type of korean chinese <clears throat> minorities the, the ethnically hybrid culturally hybrid minorities that we find in the, the southeast asia but there is a hierarchy and there are cleavages um that uh uh make a uh, collective consciousness building difficult uh than it was in let's say like the korean american community in the 1980s so that's a great thoughtful point to leave this on uh the research i've used for this podcast i am going to link below there's so much more there that we didn't get to as tends to be the case but i encourage listeners to go and read it for themselves it is a lot there and it's a lot of wonderful on the ground face-to-face research that is just a, a pleasure to read um, on that, Sharon Yoon, thanks for coming on the Korean Art Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It was great.